Now today we're going to be talking about inverse functions and how we get inverse functions and when we can take inverse functions. So first off, let's consider this function. We'll just call it shark, just a name of the function and some examples of how a shark works with the inputs and its outputs. So if we have shark of Star Wars, the output is S. Shark of input is Forrest Gump, output is F. Shark of Nacho Libre is output of N, and so on. You can see all of these inputs and outputs, and you might be able to recognize what shark actually does, what that function is doing. And so based on these examples, if we look at shark of Kung Fu Panda, think for a moment about what that output would be. And that output for Kung Fu Panda should be K. And so we can say, based on our evidence, just on these examples, that the function shark, what it does is it takes its input and then it spits out or the output is the first letter of whatever the word is. So let's say, what does shark of X function do? It outputs the first letter of the input. So thinking about the domain of shark, and you could probably argue and say the domain of shark is a few different things. Um, but the, the main idea is that the domain of shark is just words. So it's just words. However, the range of shark, we want to think about this one. What are the possible outputs for shark? Well, all these outputs here in the examples are just letters. And that's what the shark function does is it just outputs or spits out the first letter. So the only thing that it can come out are letters. So the next question is if shark is a function or not. So remember for a, something to be a function, every input has to have exactly one output. You can't have an input which can have more than one output. If that's the case, then it wouldn't be a function. But luckily for shark here, everything you put in, there's only one first letter of a word. So there's only one thing that you can get out no matter what. So let's say, yes, each input has only one output. There's no way you can get two different outputs from a single input. So the next question is, is shark one to one? So now that's going the other way. One to one, remember, says that every output has exactly one input. And it might help to answer this question if we think about this next question here. So if we have the output of some input, let's say shark of some X, some word is H, could we figure out what X or what the input is here? I want you to pause and think about that for a moment. Could we figure out what the input is if we know that the output is H? Now you may have realized that we actually can't figure out what the input is because the output being H just says that the input starts with the letter H. There are tons of words that start with the letter H. So we can't say for sure or for certain what that input is. So we would say no because many words start with H. And so that goes back to the one-to-one -one question. It's not one-to-one -one because you can have a single output have many inputs. For example, H, you can have many inputs for that. You could have Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone as the input. You could have Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets as the input. All those are inputs that would give you H out. And so there are multiple inputs that would give you the same output. So no, it's not one-to-one -one because many inputs can give 
same output. And so this idea of seeing what the output is and figuring out what the input is, is this idea of finding an inverse of going backwards or reversing the process. And this is what we're going to be focusing on today. However, with this shark function, it does not have an inverse function. Because we can't go backwards, we don't know exactly what the input could be. Uh, so we'll say no, because kind of the same thing, too many options. for the input. So we've already touched on this a bit where we define a function to be a relationship where each input, the x, has one and only one output, the y or the f of x. And if we think about that graphically, we talked about this on one of the earlier videos that we can recognize graphically if something is a function if it passes the vertical line test where the vertical line test, remember, is where if you draw a vertical line along the graph, if a vertical line hits the graph at more than one point, then it is not a function because that means you have repeated outputs for a single input. And then a special type of function is a one-to-one -one function where it is a function, so we have that each input has one and only one output. And each output has one and only one input. So it goes both ways. Each input has one and only one output, and each output has one and only one input. And graphically, we can identify a function being one-to-one -one if it passes the horizontal line test, which is the same thing as the vertical line test, but instead you're drawing a horizontal line and you're seeing if that horizontal line hits the graph at more than one point on any of those horizontal lines. And so we have what's called an inverse function, which there's a little bit of a condition on the inverse function, but the notation that we use for the inverse function is this f to the negative one. So this isn't like exponents where you see uh, x to the negative one is one over x. It's not a reciprocal. It's describing the inverse operation. So just to note, this is not a reciprocal. It's not a reciprocal. It's saying it's the inverse. But the condition that we have for an inverse function to actually be a function is that the original function needs to be a one-to-one -one function. And we'll see why this is when we look at how the inverse operation or process works. So let's actually see how we create the inverse, first using the table, then the graph, and the equation. But the general idea, and the main thing to keep in mind, is that inverses swap x and y's or it swaps the input with the output and that's essentially what's happening in the inverse is that whatever is going in is then now what's coming out and whatever's coming out is now what's going in so inputs and outputs are swapping so looking at the table all we do is we just switch or swap the x's and the y's I think the table is the nicest and easiest way to identify an, or create an inverse because if you have the point negative 2, 5, well, now that's 5, negative 2. That's all you have to do. Just swap it. Negative 1, 3 becomes 3, negative 1. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. 1, negative 1 becomes negative 1, 1. 2, negative 3 becomes negative 3, 2. That's all we have to do. And so let's plot out these points on the original function. So we'll make the original function the green, and then the inverse will be in the red. So in the green, in the original function, we have the points negative 2, 5, negative 1, 3, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, 
2, negative 3. So this is the original, so this is the original function here. See, it is represented by a line. And then the inverse function, let's see what that looks like. Let's plot out the points that we just wrote in the table. So the first point is 5, negative 2, 3, negative 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 1, negative 3, 2. And then this will also be a line. So let's connect the dots, extend the line out a little bit. So this is what the inverse function is. So this is what we call f inverse. So f to the negative 1 of x. And then the other one in the green, this is just the regular f of x, the original function. So now let's take a look at the points and where each of the points went. So we had on the original function, this was the point negative 2, 5. And then this became the point 5, negative 2. And then we had the point in the original negative 1, 3. And that became 3, negative 1. And then let's go to the bottom of the list. We'll skip the middle one. We had the point 2, negative 3 on the original. Became the point negative 3, 2 on the inverse. So what's actually happening here, if you look, is I have this line y equals x going down the middle here. And the reason why we have this line is because what's actually happening, if you look at where the points become, so they go over here, the negative 2, 5 becomes 5, negative 2, negative 1, 3 becomes 3, negative 1, and on the other end, you have negative 3, 2 becomes 2, negative 3. So there's what's actually happening is there's a reflection across this line, y equals x. And you can see it's like if you put a mirror right at y equals x, then the green, the original function, mirrors itself or flips over that y equals x function. And then you get the now inverse function in the red. So let's take a look at how we get the, the inverse function using the equation. And essentially, we're just swapping the x and y, like we do for all of these. We're just swapping the x and y, and then we're solving for y. And essentially, what we're doing is we're figuring out algebraically or analytically how do we undo all these operations or processes that are happening. So let's swap the x and y. So we have now x is equal to negative 2y plus 1. So we swap x and y first. And then we solve for y. So to solve for y, we want to get y by itself. We subtract 1 on both sides. Then we have x minus 1 is equal to negative 2y. And then get y by itself again, we divide by negative 2. And then at the end of the day, the inverse is y is equal to what we have on the left hand side there was x minus 1 over negative 2. So that's the inverse function. And we can check that by plugging in those different x values. We plug in 5, we get 5 minus 1 in the numerator, which is 4 divided by negative 2, 4 divided by negative 2 is negative 2. So that's actually correct from our table. Or if you plug in 1, you get 1 minus 1 is 0 in the numerator, divided by negative 2 is 0 as the output. So this is in line with our inverse table that we drew over here. And then describing the equations in sort of its processes or its operations, on the original equation, what we do to the input is we first multiply by negative 2, and then we add 1 to that. So on the original, we multiply by negative 2, and then we add 1. But then on the inverse, looking at order of operations, we deal with the numerator first. We subtract 1, subtract by 1, 
and then we divide by negative 2. And so if you look at what's happening in the processes, is it is very much the inverse operation or inverse processes. We're undoing what's happening in the original. In the original, we start out by multiplying by negative 2, but that's the last step that we do in the inverse. And then the original, the last step that we do is we add 1, but then we undo that first by subtracting 1 in the inverse. Now I suggest pausing here and actually trying to work out what the inverse is in the table, what the inverse is on the graph, and then what the inverse is on the equation. So pause here, try to work those out, and then resume once you're ready. So now that you tried those out, let's see and compare how we did. So the inverse on the table, just swap x and y. This one's very nice. So it's negative 11, negative 2. Negative 1, negative 4 becomes negative 4, negative 1. 0, 3 becomes negative 3, 0. 1, negative 2 becomes negative 2, 1. 2, 5 becomes 5, 2. And then on the graph, let's graph out the original. So negative 2, negative 11 is actually off the graph. Negative 11 is too big, so we'll just leave that point alone. Negative 1, negative 4, we can graph that one. 0, negative 3, we can graph. 1, negative 2, we can graph. 2, 5, we can graph. And so let's connect the dots here. And we want to graph this with a little bit of a curve to it. Because it is technically, we haven't talked about it yet, but you can see the equation. It's the cubing function with that vertical shift down by 3. So we do want to graph it with a little bit of curve on it. And now let's graph the inverse. So let's label this the f of x, the original. And then the inverse now, negative 11, negative 2. That's a little too far off the picture, so we can't graph that. Negative 4, negative 1, we can graph. Negative 3, 0. Negative 2, 1. And then 5, 2. And then we connect our dots with a little bit of curve to it. And now we can see even in a better picture that the inverse going from the original to the inverse in the graph, let's first label this, we can see exactly how this mirroring over the line y equals x works. It's a little bit nicer to see on a more curved function like this. So this point up here, the 2, 5 point becomes 5, 2. So that mirrors across the line y equals x. And then these points over here also mirror or reflect over the line y equals x. So we can see this very direct relationship graphically or visually. So now in the equation, we do the same thing that we did above. We swap to x and y, and then we solve for y. So we have the equation x equals y cubed minus 3. Now solve for y, we want to get y by itself. So we add 3 to both sides to cancel out the subtracting 3. So we have x plus 3 is equal to y cubed. And then we want to get rid of or cancel out the cubing. So what we do is we apply the cube root. This is like a square root, but we just put the 3 in there. We've talked about the cube root function before. And so the cube root is just asking what number times itself 3 times will give you whatever's in the root. But here we just use it as a tool to cancel out the cube, but then we have to do it to this side as well. And so now the result that we have here is the y is left by itself. So we have y is equal to, it's already solved for, and then what's on the other side of the equation, this is equal to the cube root of x plus 3. And so let's describe these equations using the processes. So the original processes on the y equals x cubed minus 3 function is we first apply the cube. So we cube x, then we subtract by 3. And then on the inverse, now we see order of operations do what's on the inside first, we add by 3. And then we apply the cube root. So you can see it's we're, we're going backwards. So we're going backwards in the processes, but we're also doing the opposite processes. So the subtract by 3 becomes add by 3. The cube of the x, so x cubed, 
or the value cubed then becomes the cube root. So now let's look at one more. And again, if you want more practice and to try this out on your own, so just pausing it here and then resuming once you're ready to go. So starting with the table, we have the point negative four, four becomes the point four, negative four, the point negative three, one becomes one, negative three, negative two, zero becomes zero, negative two, negative one, one becomes one, negative one, zero, four becomes four, zero. So let's graph out the original and then graph out the inverse. So on the original, we have the points negative four, four, negative three, one, negative two, zero, negative one, one, zero, four. And so you might recognize that this function looks like the quadratic or the squaring function with just a little bit of a transformation and it's shifted to the left by two. So you can see the equation part is actually plus two on the inside or on the inputs. So here, this is the original function f of x. And then let's graph the inverse function. So we have the point 4, negative 4, the point 1, negative 3, the point 0, negative 2, the point 1, negative 1, and then the point 4, 0. And so if we graph this one, it looks... It looks like this. This is the inverse function here. Now you might notice something here, but we'll talk about it in a moment. But still, think about reflection over the line y equals x. These points over here all reflect over this line. We're swapping the x's and the y's. So going back to the equation itself, let's swap the x and the y and then solve for y. So we have x is equal to y plus 2 squared. Now, to get y by itself, before we deal with anything on the inside of the parentheses, all this stuff is trapped inside by the squared. So we need to undo or get rid of that square. So to get rid of a square, we apply the square root. Those cancel, and then we apply the square root here. And now you might remember from a previous algebra or math class, that we, when we are solving for a variable and we apply the square root to undo a squaring, we can get two different answers. And those two different answers are actually the positive version and the negative version. We can always get plus or minus the square root of x in this case. So now we have plus or minus the square root of x is equal to y plus 2. And so what we do here is to get y by itself. Once again, we subtract 2 on both sides. Let's add to 0. And then we have left over is y is equal to the stuff on the other side of the equation, plus or minus x minus 2. So on the original, the processes that we do are first, inside the parentheses, we add by 2. And then next, we square order of operations, do inside the parentheses first, then exponents. And on the inverse, we do the square root, and then we subtract by two. So again, it's just that idea of undoing those operations or those processes. So you might have seen that there's a problem with this inverse. And that problem is, is that if we look at the vertical line test, pretty much anywhere on this function, or on this inverse relation, we hit the graph at two points. So that means that there are repeated outputs for an individual input. So what that means is that the inverse relation, the inverse equation is not a function. The inverse is not a function.